I trust that you all have done that, and uh, just to get a, a better understanding of what the school's obligations are. If there's any questions, I, I definitely don't mind discussing some of those pieces, but if not, I just wanted to bring that to your attention um, and continue reviewing in your own, in your own time. Sure, but, which, I mean, from your perspective, what's the big takeaway on that, piece, on that particular job? I think the biggest takeaway is just really providing, providing the foundational pieces for what Title IX is actually supposed to look like. As you can see, it's pretty lengthy. Um, it really just gives an overview of what uh, Title IX is supposed to be from what sexual harassment includes some details and how you actually uh, look at age as it relates to these incidents, particularly involving younger students. I think one of the examples in that says that, you know, a first grader or kindergartner kissing another kindergartner on the cheek is not necessarily sexual harassment. So it gave some good context, but it's really the foundational piece for how schools are supposed to operate under Title IX, particularly because the Obama regulations have been rescinded by the Trump administration with the second piece, the orange sheet. Yes. And this is dated 2001. Mm -hmm. it, is, it has not been updated since then, when even with all of the there are, so that's what the policy, how we talked about rewriting the policy in this uh, Title IX committee before dating back to March. The Trump administration is, you know, on whole, is about to release some major updates. And the Obama administration did as well, but when the Trump administration came in place, they rescinded those Obama administration guidelines. So those guidelines that were live and were really the guiding posts, they took those away. So now it reverts back to 2001 along with the orange sheet, which is the interim uh, guidelines. So I'll talk about that next. Okay. So you have to read all these together to really understand how Title IX is supposed to work. So that's the foundational piece of 2001 guidelines. And then the number two is the September 2017 Q&A on campus sexual misconduct. Uh, once the Trump administration uh, withdrew the Obama guidelines, uh, they then came up with this orange piece here which is what schools are supposed to do in the interim along with the 2001 guidelines. So this orange sheet, the 2017 piece, is just a quick Q&A to, to give schools some guidelines in the interim and, the, and as we're waiting for the final regulations to be approved and adopted, which is what we're, we're still waiting for. Um, so you all can review that. I trust that you all reviewed that in your time just to understand what Title IX is. If you have any questions about that, you definitely can uh, share those with me. Uh, but that brings us to the main point of the, the policies today, and that is this, this blue sheet here. So the Trump administration last year, or maybe late 2018, put out a proposed regulation for what the Trump administration's new Title IX regulations will look like. Um, so there are much more lengthy than this blue sheet here, However, I've scoured the internet and found that this blue sheet here did the best, best job of articulating how the proposed guidelines from the Trump administration will affect particularly pre-K through 12 districts. All the other pieces that I've seen talk about higher education mixed in, but you know, higher education and K through 12 are definitely different. So I, want, I thought this was a good time to talk about some of these things, how they affect the school district with uh, this particular group some things I see on the horizon and, and what elements I see might be uh, problematic or things that we need to address. So I'll just go through these things starting at point number one. So the proposed guidelines from the Trump administration talks about changing the definition of harassment. Um, the previous definition was essentially unwelcome conduct of a sexual nature. So as I said, the Trump administration is in, under the belief that the Title IX has swung too far in favor of the complainant. So they're trying to move that pendulum back to be a little bit more fair and making sure that there's a little bit more due process provided to individuals that have been accused. Um, so you can see that here in point number one, changing the definition of harassment. And uh, as the author of this particular uh, post wrote, you can see where it says unwelcome conduct it takes it out of a sexual nature. And it says on the basis of sex that is severe, persistent, pervasive. So it's not too far removed from what we've previously been doing, um, but that is a change that the Trump administration has highlighted, but I don't think that would be a problem in particular for implementing that when the proposed regulations go live. Also, 
Number two is a change to the regulations on the case resolution timeline. So under the Obama administration, uh, Title IX incidents were supposed to be resolved within 60-day time frame. Um, we're not shooting for 60 days, but at the very least, they need to be resolved within 60 days pen, um, outside of some other uh, factor. So the Trump administration has removed that 60-day timeline. They did so even in the, the orange sheet, which is the 2017 interim guideline. So when it comes to these Title IX incidents, someone says, hey, I, my child has been accused of a Title IX incident. How long do these processes take? before we could say, you know, we could allow up to 60 days, but now we were not able to do that. So um, we just need to make sure that, and when we're actually drafting our, um, or conclude our draft of the new policies for the Board of Education, that we include some type of time frame, um, and we could discuss what that number would look like, but that's something that we definitely need to do in there. Also, point number three, there's a change to the definition of what constitutes uh, notice. So, notice beforehand was pretty overarching. It talked about uh, the obligation for school system to have responsible employees and whatnot, and that was pretty broad. So, the notice definition change here is going to narrow it a little bit more uh, to the fact that the report has to be made to the Title IX coordinator, has to be actual notice, and that could be satisfied by providing some type of written. Uh, report to the, that gets to the Title IX coordinator. So that actually relieves some of the burden on the school system, the district, for what individuals need to know before it triggers those Title IX obligations on the school or on the district. So that's point number three. And these things are not major changes. It's just it's something that we put in the policy. Major changes are a little bit further down. Um, point number three, uh, point number four, piggybacking off of point number three, changes the definition of responsible employees. So a responsible employee, is, of course, is anyone that works for the school system or a college that hears about an incident that's related to Title IX, sexual discrimination, sexual harassment. Uh, if a person is deemed a responsible employee, that means that they have an obligation to make sure that they report that to the school principal. Um, under these proposed guidelines, the definition of a responsible employee would be narrowed a bit. And it could mean that we would just have it be you know, actual teachers, the educators. Uh, currently, it could be individuals such as a bus driver, maybe a cafeteria worker, indiv individuals like that. But I, under the proposed guidelines under point number four, it would uh, be able to allow us to change responsible employees to just include the actual teachers, and we can have discussions about that. So that's something that we'll have to actually have discussions about who are responsible employees, what individuals do we want in our policy uh, to be responsible employees. I think that there could be arguments on that. Some would argue that if we you know, narrow the definition of what a responsible employee is, we're no longer making our students as safe because that would mean that you know, if a cafeteria worker heard about an incident, they're not a teacher, so therefore they don't actually have to report that to the principal of the school. Um, so why would we want that at all? Some schools or some individuals are under the belief that the Title IX obligations or Title IX has gone too far in regards to what schools are actually supposed to respond to. So that's the other side. So if schools, some argue that schools are you know, doing beyond what Title IX actually required. So this allows schools to kind of cut back their uh, scope and the breadth of their work when it comes to Title IX to narrow that focus from all employees to just the ones that teachers would most, the students would most likely report these incidents to. So it just depends on what side of the aisle you want, you're on, really. But we, what we can be so, more broad in our own Right, so these, these policies here are not what we have to do. They're the floor. We could, we could go on top of these if we wanted to designate more individuals as responsible employees, we could. But let's say we we thought that you know, maybe it is a good idea for us to have a more narrow definition of what a responsible employee is, then these policies would allow us to do that they, if they go live. We don't have to, it just provides us more options. So we'll have to continue to have discussions on what's the best stance for the district, but it provides us more room to make a decision if, if we wanted to do that, but we don't have to. I think we've already had those conversations before you got here. So. Yeah, well, I definitely wanted to talk about, I'm not sure if we ever talked about what the actual regulations 
looked like. Yeah. So I just wanted to do that with the Title IX committee. So I know there might have been policy discussions before. I'm not sure if those policy discussions took place after looking at what the proposed guidelines actually were. So are there requirements for like a responsible employee? Like if you consider somebody a responsible employee, do they have to have certain types of training or something? Yes, yeah, so okay. uh, that is something that's on, on my uh, desk essentially. Developing training for responsible employees okay. that they would get on a regular basis to where they would know uh, what their responsibilities are. Some of those trainings I've already started myself in person, starting with APs, principals, social workers, where I walk, through, walk them through what our policy says, what the definitions are, certain conducts that they could reasonably expect to see from their students, how to spot those. And also with the rolling out of our <coughs> Ethics 360 reporting system, we've done training through that to talk about um, how individuals, once they hear about those reports, what individuals they're supposed to re report to and how they're actually supposed to do it. So we're, we've already started some of that work, yeah. uh, but now I'm in the process of trying to figure out how we can get that on a broader scale. But if we considered like a, a cafeteria worker or something a responsible employee, they would have to receive that type of training? Yeah, but they okay. would be receiving that type of training. With the darkness to light training that I've done already with the coaches, the um, administrators, principals and assistant principals, I already scheduled to do with um, counselors and social workers, would that count? Because it does um, talk about required mandated reporting, signs to look for and that kind of thing. Because I have not sat in that, I'm not quite 100, I'm not sure. But I'm open to the, those discussions. I think there are, it doesn't have to be super all in, encompassing. So I'm pretty sure that most of it, what you talk about in that darkness to light probably covers a lot of these pieces. But uh, I, we definitely could sit down to see what Title IX requires and making sure we're ch checklisting. But if you're talking about what our policies currently are, things to look out for and how to report, that you're covered you know, 80% of what responsible employee training is supposed to look like. And responsible employee training is different than what assistant principals would get um, for the most part. Responsible employee training is not as in depth. It's really just to talk about, because your role as responsible employee is really just to be that bridge to resources. Just when someone makes a report to you, make sure that report gets to the hands of an individual that can actually solve the problem, whether it be a Title IX coordinator or a principal at your school, uh, versus the AP training. They're the ones that are actually doing those investigations, so their tra training is a little bit more in depth. So I, I think if you're covering those pieces in that darkness to light, I think that uh, we're probably good there, and we'll see how we can you know, continue pushing it out to broader areas. I, I thought myself, maybe it's me recording some type of video, since I'm not going to be able to get to every single school recording some type of video that talks about uh, what those mandatory uh, training requirements are and something like that that I could send out to schools because um, I'm not going to be able to go to every single school to do this. And generally these trainings happen over the summertime at most schools, most districts that are complying with Title IX. And then something that we can roll into the onboarding process. Yes, and then the, that would be the ideal onboarding. Every time we get a new employee, right. um, that's a responsible employee, whether it's all employees or in the future if we narrow that dis definition, it would be part of the onboarding process. And maybe every other year, they'd have to sit through that um, training as well. The good thing about Darkness to Light is it's a two hour training mm -hmm. that you know it's best face to face because it gives the opportunity for um, staff to talk mm -hmm. about um, areas in their um, environment, doing an environmental scan of their schools and thinking about places where children may be isolated. But also there is a online component that would be able to bring in those people who maybe start work, before, you know, after the training has happened for that particular school year or, or that That's kind good. Of thing. Yeah. Pressures. I, I, I feel like I'm still new, but maybe I can't say that anymore. I've been here since September <coughs> at this point. So yes, I know that we've already been doing some things that are already getting us mm -hmm. closer to compliance or in compliance already. So mm -hmm. that's one of those initiatives that uh, has already been in place. So yes. I think it I think it'll be good to Look at the pieces that, for example, darkness to light, for example, what we already have in onboarding processes, and then what's a part of our mandatory um, staff training every year because we have, especially in student support, we've got a pretty lengthy slide deck of all the different pieces um, of mandatory alerts or notifications or to go into training mm -hmm. for staff. If we pull all that together and make sure we have all the pieces, um, I think you're going to find that, that a lot of this is already done. It's just going to be in a couple of different places. Yep, and I know we talked about it in our uh, student support meeting about yes. getting out what pieces of training are going. So yes, we get those things on paper. We can see the roadmap. Yep. Because um, we're already 
Yes. 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 We, we, yep. So we yeah. talked about some of those things already. I just <laughs> want to bring them to the larger community uh, <laughs> committee here. And education is a little different. We have a, a new start point every year. It's not mm -hmm. like an agency where some folks come in all throughout the process. So we do, and state mandate is a list, more than it's longer every year, the legislature passes the new list that you're supposed to train someone on. So looking at how we deliver that opening training uh, and maybe breaking it up over monthly, because, and, and I've seen past slide deck and any slide decks, when you do that opening meeting, you're literally covering 20 things the state says you have to cover at the beginning of every year. And so some stuff can get lost in that, in that process as well. Yeah, so um, there are definitely continuing discussions to be had about how we actually go about implementing some of the things that uh, Title IX requires, but we're definitely, pieces are there, just to make sure that we're all on the same page with those pieces. So going back to the... Uh, yeah, you got a question. Yeah, so how, how is this different than, and I, I might not be as versed as others in the room, but the, the mandatory requirements, if you suspect, you know, child abuse, you know, you have to turn it over to DSS, like no matter who you are. Right. You're, you're not named as a responsible person. So why would we want to only let certain people be able to turn it over when I thought that the law required that we had to turn it over? Well, all of Title IX incidents do not necessarily implicate child abuse or neglect. A no, no them, I'm, I'm using that as an example. Right. So um, <clears throat> that's, I'm not advocating either way. I'm just saying that's an option. <clears throat> Okay. Uh, but I, I don't think this is the That's best place the to have that is. discussion at the moment, but this is what the guidelines allow for us to do. Okay. We can have those discussions, you know, when we're going back to the policy writing and things like that. If that's something we want to actually put in our policy, um, but at the moment, it's, it's just an option that the federal government has allowed us to have a little bit more leeway in regarding who is a responsible employee. But I definitely understand the point. There are some individuals that would say that would make students less safe. Other individuals might say, well, that's good because it allows schools are, are, are getting too in-depth with Title IX anyway. Law enforcement is there for those type of things. So it just depends on what really how you, how you view the regulations. But going back to mandated reporting, uh, that's a state law, I believe. Of course, federal, Title IX is a federal law. Um, a, lot of a lot of incidents that are Title IX can be child abuse or neglect, but not 100%. So you can have a situation that's Title IX that doesn't necessarily involve abuse or neglect. However, it also might involve criminal elements, so we have mandatory reporting there as well. So there's a number of different uh, jurisdictions, a number of different policies that are operating, laws that are operating on uh, the school system at, at once, and just, just how, how these things operate, essentially. But I'm not, I'm not opposed either way. I'm just open to discussion at this point still. So going back to the um, policy, I think we're on Number five, so it's going to add guidelines about what informal resolutions look like. So currently, um, informal resolutions, schools kind of do this on their daily, day-to-day -day basis when an incident occurs and the principal might handle it themselves informally. That's essentially what an informal resolution looks like. Um, so under Title IX, the proposed guidelines are requiring a little bit more documentation when it even comes to informal um, allegations and notice. So one thing is that informal resolution will require detailed notice to involve parties including specific details around allegations. So that's going to require schools, principals most likely uh, to at the very least, and it doesn't say in writing so I'm not sure if it has to be in writing or if it can be something where you're telephoning a parent or bringing that child into the office to tell them what they've been accused of. Um, but it will provide some type of notice requirement for uh, individuals that are involved in the Title IX incident. And so also it will require school systems to develop some type of written policy what, what, about what the informal uh, resolution process will look like. So that's something else that it will require. And also just specific criteria which will preclude, preclude an informal resolution. So what that means is that we have to specifically set out what incidents we cannot resolve through an informal resolution. Um, under Title IX, generally, anything that rises to the level of sexual assault, we would not handle through an informal resolution, uh, meaning that some, once someone has been physically touched in an area that they deem to be sexual in nature, we're not going to informally resolve that. 
we're going to go through that formal process where there's an investigation and report and all those requirements, uh, much more slow than what the informal process would look like. Also, with the informal resolution process, it's going to require the agreement of all parties involved. So if the respondent says, I'm open to having this resolved through an informal resolution, which could include things such as maybe students mediate an issue. I know the schools have mediation, student mediation, peer mediation. Uh, maybe that avenue would be open for an incident that's sexual in nature, but does not involve touching. Maybe a student saying to another student something that's making them uncomfortable and sexual in nature. That could be prime and ripe for an informal resolution. Um, so it, it really just depends, but we're going to have to spell out some specifics of what informal resolutions will look like in our policy as well. But we cannot in include uh, sexual assault, any type of touching of unwanted nature. That's not going to be anything that could be resolved informally. And if both parties do not agree to uh, an informal resolution, then of course we can't force that informal resolution. So I think that would be the, the two points where we would preclude any type of informal resolution. Would any of these allegations, would, any, would it, an informal resolution ever include um, teen court? It could. Um, I'm not sure. Do we already implement or utilize teen court in some schools? It's used through um, the Department of Juvenile Justice as okay. a part of just like uh, how they disposition or um, divert cases. Your SROs uh, make referrals to teen court. Um, okay. in, in that situation, though, you know, we, we, we have to meet the threshold just like we do of, of formal charges that we have, that, that we law enforcement believe that probable cause exists that a crime has been committed. Right. Um, and then, but, but the, the concept of that is to, um, you know, defer that case away from either, you know, at this point, the juvenile system, previously the adult system and the juvenile system, uh, to an entity that can impose, you know, a punishment, if you will, on the, on the individual, on the offender, uh, but not create a criminal record for them. So, um, to, I mean, I, as far as referrals outside of law enforcement, um, I know that they will take them, um, but from our standpoint, we have to establish probable cause that a crime has been committed, and then we would refer those. Well, I and so, I just want to interject okay, really quickly. And so hearing that, if it rises to the element of probable cause that a crime has been committed, then it's probably most likely not going to be an incident that we could resolve informally anyway. So if this was a crime, most likely someone's touched someone without consent, which is going to be a crime, They're, that are automatically precluded from the informal resolution process. But if incidents such as, you know, he said this to me, I didn't like it, it was sexual in nature, generally that's not going to be a crime because there's no touching there. Uh, so that would be okay to re resolve through the informal mechanism. But teen court, if that's resolved, designed specifically to be a deferment process from criminal record, criminal pr proceeding, then I don't see how those two would uh, be able to relate for informal process. And they have, and they have a, a specific list of um, misdemeanor, essentially non-aggravated misdemeanor crimes that they will accept. Um, you know, simple assault, for example. However, like, you know, if it's a, a sexual battery, um, you know, un unwanted touching of a, a sexual organ or area to gratify the, the offender, uh, that's not a case that teen court would take. That yeah. would have to go through either a juvenile or adult system. Yeah, so, yeah I, would, I guess I was just asking, are there any instances of things that we could possibly do refer there like um, when my daughter did it you know she would you know tell about i mean she didn't have, didn't give details but some of the cases would be like you know so and so brought orange juice um, vodka in his orange juice in his water bottle and so he had to go and you know that it's underage drinking so you're in trouble but i mean that's to me is a little bit different than you know something that would be perceived sexual in nature because it's just, it just seems that we would have to do more training with our children um, to understand the implications of that. So I was just curious if that was on the list of things that could possibly <clears throat> go to teen court or if we'd ever had any that go to teen court. Yeah, I, I think overall with Title IX, once involved law enforcement, those allegations are automatically must be resolved outside of the informal process because they're so severe or so serious that that Title IX requires us to handle it in another manner. Um, so going back to the document number six, requires separation of roles in K-12. 
And this is a process that I've already been starting and talking about in my trainings with APs, wanting to have a so APs, principals, and social workers have clearly identifiable roles in our Title IX process. So this is something that I was able to pick up on pretty early on in the process. And um, that's where I talk about having the separation of roles where the Title IX coordinator, I oversee all of those things, but I don't actually do those investigations. You know, currently I am doing those investigations sometimes. It's just a matter of continuing those trainings to get the schools themselves in a uh, better spot or where they can feel comfortable to take over those trainings in the future. Um, also, the role of the investigator, that would be the assistant principals at the schools. They would actually do those investigations. The decision maker is going to be the principal, so the principal has to stay out of the investigations until the AP actually provides them that final report. And that's where I talked about changing the role of social workers and counselors. Uh, taking them out of that resolution process in general and just having them as a support person that can help guide students through these processes. And then also there's a fifth element there talking about the, if there's appeals afforded to these processes. At this point, we do allow for appeals once they get to the level of long-term suspension or expulsion. The way we currently handle appeals in that process, I don't believe that there would be any type of uh, issue moving forward being that the board are the ones that actually make the decisions on the appeal process. So I don't see any conflict of roles in that point. So that's somewhere we're, we're already on the right track uh, for Title IX compliance there. Number seven, uh, changing the guidelines on supportive measures. This is another piece where we're already on the right track here. Um, I talk about interim safety plans or things like that. And this is talking about those interim safety plans when individuals uh, make a report and are uh, accusing another student of some type of Title IX incident. Uh, in the interim, we need to investigate, correct, but in the interim, individuals, we want to make sure that they're still in school. That's what Title IX is all about, making sure that uh, we stop preventing and remedy any type of sexual misconduct or gender discrimination that denies a person the ability to participate in an educational program or activity. So when an allegation comes in, we can't automatically go from zero to resolution quickly we have to do a process to afford due process and, and, and investigate. However, we still have a situation where students might be uncomfortable with each, with each other. So this is where these support measures come, in, come into play. And in training on support measures and doing the training that I've conducted with individuals in the school system here, I've talked about, particularly with principals, um, making sure that we are treating individuals as fairly as possible and making sure that support measures, interim support, services, safety plans, stay away agreements are as neutral and balanced as possible. Uh, what this is getting at is making sure that school systems do not automatically assume individuals that have been accused of Title IX incidents, schools don't actually treat individuals that have been accused as if they're responsible before we've completed an investigation. So like as I said, talk about the Trump administration swinging, swinging that pendulum back towards um, more due process and more protection for the accused students. This is one of those examples. So we've already been training on this, making sure that when principals are considering, and APs are considering safety plans in the schools for individuals with Title IX incidents, we're making sure that they're fair and neutral as possible. For example, if one person says, the complainant says, this happened to me, I want this person removed from my classroom. If we haven't completed our investigation and things like that, we might not necessarily be able to remove that student from the classroom, but we could offer that person that's making the complaint uh, option to remove themselves from the classroom if it makes them more comfortable while we're investigating this complaint. So that also goes to uh, another point, point B. Um, I know that sometimes we will suspend students on allegations uh, involving Title IX incidents in the interim. However, the Trump administration and point B on number, number seven is really taking a look at how schools do that because they could view that process as treating an individual that's been accused of a Title IX incident suspending them before we've completed the investigation is going to look like we're punishing them before we actually know that they're responsible for what they've been accused of. So in that, uh, the Trump administration is proposing that we have a risk assessment to figure out uh, what the safety concern is before a person can be suspended in the interim for a Title IX incident. Um, so what that would look like is we would utilize the district special education process. Now, I am not involved in special education, but I assume that means that's talking about things such as the, um, the IEPs and related to manifestation determinations, things such as that. 
think that should ring some bells for some individuals in here. So we'll have to have discussions with student support in, in regards to what type of um, risk assessment analysis schools would go through or some type of threat assessment. Maybe we can borrow from some of the points that are utilized in the, um, I think that's, that's Tanya, what the, is this? The Berkeley or the... Right, maybe yeah. use some of those elements to try to uh, figure out a system that we could have on paper that we could utilize in, um, in situations where individuals have been accused of Title IX incidents, so we just don't automatically suspend before we know the details. But that's, that's ongoing discussions, but I definitely have been training principals to say we need to slow down. That's part of the slowing down process. Uh, there's been incidents where you know, students have been suspended, and I've had to call the principal back and say, hey, let's, let's talk about this a little bit more. Why are we doing this? Do we have more information that we could pinpoint back to the allegation to why that person needs to be suspended? So this just talking about that, providing more due process and not treating an individual as if they're responsible for what they've been accused of before we actually have completed that assessment or found them to be responsible after an investigation. Can we talk about that just a little bit more? Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm assuming, well, two things. One is I'm assuming you mean for every student, not just um, special ed students, that this risk analysis has to be done. For so to clarify that. So yet yeah, when right. there's been an allegation of sexual misconduct or gender discrimination, uh, some of those are pretty serious, even the allegation itself, but we don't know those to be true just yet. We just have one side, which is an allegation. So these new proposal regulations would require us to adopt some of those same mechanisms. We have to look at each individual case on an individual basis, determine is this person at risk so much so that they, we need to suspend that person while we do the investigation. Right, even though it goes through the special ed department. Um, the second thing is, I guess I want to I want to kind of suss out the difference between slowing down and being more deliberate and thorough, and I think that that's an important distinction because I don't want to make it. I don't want us to to slow down for the sake of slowing down. I want us to be more deliberate and thorough. Yes, that, that's um, that's what I'm being more deliberate and thorough in what right. we're doing, having a reason that we could point to for what we're, what actions we're taking, yes. Right, because I think it's important for the, the safety of the person, of, of both parties, really. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But if we have a, a safety issue, we owe it to, to both students to make sure that we address that safety issue, um, that safety concern as, 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 as deliberately as possible. Mm -hmm. So um, do we have, um, I want to make sure that we've got a mechanism or we're going to have a mechanism in place to make sure that that risk analysis can be done um, so that if we do need to do a suspension, we can do that um, for the, 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 uh, the what, you know, what's in the best interest of the student who, who um, you know, is doing the, um, it, it, the alleged victim, I guess, is the correct word. So. Um, are we working towards that end that we're gonna we're gonna be able to come up with that risk analysis and be able to address that concern? Yeah, so we have uh, student support meetings every Monday. I think that would be the best starting point to get these things in on paper, and we could present those to the, the larger committee as a whole. Um, but I don't think we're too far away in regards to what we would need to do. We just really need to really just put on paper what are some triggers that would require or what would necessitate some type of uh, decision to call this person or this particular incident a certain level of threat that we would need or that would warrant some type of suspension in the interim. So mm -hmm. I think the student support meetings that we already have uh, every Monday would be a, a great starting point, uh, particularly I because special education is already in there. Ms. Varnum, I'm sorry, um, has a good knowledge of how that could work. And, and I agree that I think that's a good place we can do it, and we can create, we can develop our own assessments. I mean, we've we've done that in the past, but we've also adopted for our um, homicide threat protocol or suicide threat protocol um, specific validated tools that have been studied and researched and, and replicated. So I think it's going to be good to to search and see if there's something that would um, be a great starting point for us, maybe to um, train on borrow, really study. The other thing I want to, so I agree with you completely. We can definitely add that to our Monday agenda. Um, the other thing I want to mention is the statement on that risk assessments must be conducted in compliance with the district's special education processes. So it's not uncommon for, um, for federal documents or federal charges to 
align with compliance to, to special education processes because under IDEA it's very clear that if you're going to provide an assessment you have parental notice and consent, you have appropriately trained individual um, administering that assessment and there and you know you, you know where you're going to store it you know that you have a response with it and there's prior written notice um, so I'm not surprised to see that language but I do want to clarify that that doesn't mean that it's a special education function it's just that in the absence of very specific regulations on how to implement or how to um, administer an evaluation or assessment lean on IDEA regulations because it's so specific on how assessments are administered. Right. So clarify that. Yeah. Essentially they said, you know, yeah, it is absolutely not related to special ed it at is all. Not. It's it is not. about assessment practices. Correct. It's borrowing those pieces that we, uh, there's, when it comes to IDEA, um, there's a lot of protection for students that have, uh, are involved in those processes. They're essentially saying this process is so good when you're doing these Title IX suspensions, utilize these principles from this process. Mm -hmm. But, but they don't have to be special education students or anything like that. It's just borrowing some of those same principles and guiding posts mm -hmm. uh, for this Title IX process. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I think it's important to make that determination and be very clear about the fact that we're not just talking about special ed students, we're talking about all students. Correct, all students involved yeah. in the Title IX process. And yes. it's actually not, yeah, it, it's not related to the student population at all. It's related to how assessments are delivered in, IDE, in accordance with IDEA, you would make sure any risk assessment that you do for your district under Title IX meets at least that, regardless of the kid okay. and their, and and their disability determination. It's a good starting point because yeah. I, mean, I knew you would be knowledgeable about those processes. When I know we're talking about policy now, but I think this also is bringing up a lot of that kind of talk we had about making sure as we're doing these things with talking about videos and things to the schools, it's also that public education because you look at the power dynamics of a lot of this um, from a trauma-informed or even a resiliency-informed perspective. You know, the wording of some of it, we understand why it's necessary, but it's really difficult if you have a young person who is in the midst of this. You know, I, I know there was a lot of stuff around like the stay away directive or agreements and things like that, but for someone, they feel like then it's, their fault because they're being asked to you know do these things we even talk about with victims who have a protective order we're very clear that protective order is in place on the abusive person for their behaviors and you're not legally obligated to you know because it's about their behavior and that's after and I know there's after a process they've mm -hmm. been in front of courts and things like that so I think again the wording that the way that we approach it and just making sure um, there's a clear understanding of those things so we are dealing with young people often who in those power dynamics with other people think that it's something they've done or and I know the wording has to be very technical and, and we know that but sometimes in our ability to communicate that to even adults or, or staff like it gets lost on, on younger people <laughs> and agree. so how do we and, and do those things in a way that really makes sense for everyone because when we put everybody on a level playing field that makes very much sense for what we're doing and like you said for everyone involved but for whoever ultimately whether it's the accused or the the victim who was the person perpetrated against this offense that's going to feel very um traumatizing so. and that's the why i was specifically talking about those new roles yeah having counselors i love that i was, I was thinking that is support really great that they're not going to be involved because in that. that is that is something that i see on a day-to-day -day yes. basis in my role here individuals are feeling like they're being treated unfairly and things like that and just just have anxiety about going through the process so having an individual that yeah. is naturally empathetic and caring and knowledgeable about what they're going through yeah. uh, can assist them and walk them through those processes so yeah well and like you said and not to have to be involved in them the decision making or investigation and have that person really be the support for both parties i think that's like perfect you know to think about a no-brainer yeah. and just like you said just a lot of times even our kids know more about it than the parents get lost at this piece so too as we are just thinking like you said how do we then translate this and keep that momentum going because this is i'm so grateful for this like because i'm like oh wow like we've been working on this for so long and even a lot of us at the college level this is the most clarity i've had on this issue in so long just to know how this is working so i think that's important for all of us yeah i think that's a very important piece so um yeah, we'll have those support persons there, and also yeah. one, once we do get the policy written, once the administration has gone live with theirs, uh, I think being able to take the policy that we write and, and mm -hmm. train students 
in a way that makes sense and understand is understanding uh, for them. For example, maybe for uh, elementary students, we still have a policy that we talk to them about, but it doesn't necessarily look like mm -hmm. the policy that maybe a middle school or in a high school are trained on. But something to their uh, their level where they can understand what behaviors are appropriate and what aren't. And that's something Title IX would affect yeah. us. And even with the PTAs and just having something that we can get a little ease of understanding too, just the more that we're talking about this, I think the easier it's going to be and the better people will feel going through the process. Um, I agree. But thank you for all your, I'm just saying just being aware of that is important. I agree, yeah. Education is definitely important. So going back to... Um, Jarrell. So, go ahead, you go first. Well, I mean, I just want to kind of build on that as, as we're going through this. I kind of feel like this piece is going to be what we need to focus on most in um, both policy and implementation. Because I think um, the way this reads um, of, of things not being punitive and the, the idea that the person who has to be separated is the reporter. And I think it's very, going to be very hard to implement, implement that way in a way that this person who already feels that they've been victimized doesn't feel like they're being punished is going to be very, very difficult and something that we're going to have to focus on very carefully and how it's implemented and how we train people in the schools to implement it. Uh, because I think this is where the school system has been in trouble and, and where we have a lot of frustration from parents and students. Yeah, and so, and some of these things when it comes to these interim guidelines, I'm pretty sure some principals have been frustrated with me when I'm talking to them about what we can do in the interim because we can't rely on those old tropes like it says when it comes to how we respond to these incidents. So it's a little bit of a different process for everyone involved. Um, it, it goes against what, we, what school's generally done for all the years that we've been mandatory educating the students. So uh, they're definitely ongoing discussions in my day-to-day -day life and when I'm, responding to Title IX incidents, a lot of it is uh, supporting and being empathetic to students and parents that feel like they're going through a process that doesn't feel great to them, trying to explain to them that, you know, this outcome does not mean that your child was lying or anything like that. It just means that, you know, we might not have the evidence to show it, but just being supportive is possible. So I, I agree. Um, it's going to take some time, practice implementing training to get these things in place. So do we have a way to address um, the situation that let's say like if we can't suspend you know the person like you would do a police officer he gets you know suspension while you're investigating his case or her case the what about if a student decides not to come to school because they don't feel like their case is being handled appropriately or they don't feel safe but now they've missed school um, that might be construed as unexcused in it, why you're what why we're doing the risk analysis yeah so I definitely and in communication with principals and student support all the time when it comes to these title IX incidents to figure out students that might have been uh, involved in an incident that are complainants and they're not feeling comfortable and I think student support myself and principals we're all on the same page in that we will do whatever we can to make sure students are feeling comfortable so that they don't have to remove themselves from school whether that means offering the person that's made the complaint an opportunity to, you know, go to a different classroom, alter their schedule, maybe means going to a completely different school, but everyone and from central office to the individual school itself. Just allowing them to know what their options are and allowing them to make the choice themselves, whatever they're most comfortable with. So when it comes to these safety plans, I definitely share with students and parents, whatever you're most comfortable with, you have to have that open dialogue with us because we won't know unless you tell us. So that's essentially how we operate. Once a parent or student tells us what they're comfortable with or what they're uncomfortable with, the principal will contact me. I'll be in contact with student support and we'll really just hammer out a, a plan from a safety perspective. It works one day, then the next day the person says, you know, I'm not comfortable with this. We really just have to, on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, look at what we have on paper and have that open dialogue. That's essentially what, we, what we've done in the past, what we're doing now, and that's essentially what this is going to require for us and um, the future. These things are, are interim. They're not set in stone. They can change. And definitely there's language when I send those notices of investigation for the incident that talk about interim safety plans. There's a whole paragraph in there that talks about how they're not punitive and how it explains what the purpose of them are for. So I think we just have to continue in that process. But we're definitely, I definitely get support from student support and principals. They're open to whatever we can do to make sure that students are feeling um, comfortable. So going back to the guidelines, talks about notice to parties, like I just said, 
I've been providing notice of allegations. So uh, Title IX is going to now require us to provide advance written notice of allegations and be provided sufficient time to prepare a response before an interview can be conducted. So in my trainings, I've been talking about contacting parents first and things like this. Now, I believe this is talking about more of those uh, formal processes, those more severe allegations when it involves actual some type of touching without consent of a sexual uh, organ. So uh, this is something that I've definitely been talking to the principals about, um, just preparing them, you know, to slow down the process because um, generally how we operate, a lot of things happen really quickly. But under Title IX, these new proposed regulations, we're going to be slowing some things down because we have to do things such as provide written notice and allow for an opportunity for them to prepare a defense, to prepare a case. And so when it comes to these notices of allegations, uh, when I'm sending those out, we already identify the party. So we're not, the individuals that are accused are not a guessing game of, I've been accused of a serious incident and I don't know anything about it. That's essentially what this is for. So having the identity of the parties involved in, in notice and also referencing uh, the policy violation itself, making sure that schools are actually looking at 8410, which is the policy, conduct policy, and pointing back to a definition under the policy that says you cannot do this and tying it to the allegation itself. That's something that's going to be required under Title IX as well and to allowing sufficient time. There's no, no guideline for what sufficient time is. I think maybe a week after we send that notice might be sufficient. Some might think it's three calendars, three school days. So it, there's no 100% guidance on that just yet, but either way we have to allow, particularly with these more severe allegations, when the incident comes in, we're not actually starting that investigation that same day. You have to send that notice first, allow time to receive it, and then I'll move forward with the investigation process. Going to number nine, an advisor of choice. We essentially do this anyways, uh, allowing individuals that have been accused of Title IX processes, letting them know. That's why we contact parents first, because parents are going to be an advisor. And we're also dealing with minors, letting them know that we're not going to start conducting interviews of students and things like that until they've had an opportunity to have an advisor of their choice, whether it's their parent or an attorney. That's something that Title IX requires, again, having more due process involved. Um, so that's something I've definitely been talking about, and I don't think that would be a major change. Just more training, letting principals know how that's supposed to be. Also, both parties in the incident? yes, so that's parties, not witnesses, but just the parties. So if you've been accused or if you made the complaint, um, definitely contacting parents beforehand. Now, I think it, I think it is both parties. Let me double check. Um, it is. Both for, parties. Yes. So if they want to support, that's why I think having individuals in those social worker counselor roles is going to be really good. Also, individuals where they say, well, I can't find a support person. The school is going to be under obligation to provide them a support person, which we would just take from that pool of counselors, social workers. So that's going to you know, resolve a number of issues there. But nine times out of ten, persons already know who their support person is. It's going to be their parent or it's going to be an attorney in my um, time here so far. So talk, number ten talks about the burden of proof. Um, there's not much to say about that. It just talks about the burden of proof. Essentially, schools have to do these investigations themselves to find out if there's a conduct policy or not. Uh, going to point number eleven requires a provision of access to all evidence to in involve parties. So it says, point A, at least 10 calendar days prior to the finalization of the investigative report, the district school must take, make available all relevant evidence. So what that looks like is currently what we're doing in these Title IX incidents, when they get to this level, uh, I am allowing parties, I'll schedule a time for parties to come in and review the allegations, see all the evidence against them. And what that means is that they can actually keep a copy of uh, any statement that they've provided themselves, they can keep those copies. Statements from other individuals, they can view, but they can't keep. Uh, physical evidence, such as, you know, uh, text messages, they can view those things, but they can't keep those unless it's come from them. And video, uh, if the school has surveillance cameras, they can view those things as well. So school districts, we're not allowed to hide the ball when it comes to these Title IX instances. We have to allow all evidence to be uh, reviewed. Now, with this point number 11, there are discussions about how this actually gets done. So some districts, or really in higher education, they talk about these processes of having some type of platform, almost like Ethics 360, where you can upload all the investiga investiga investigation material. And then from there, individuals would be able to access the materials online, view what, 
whatever evidence is in real time as we're uploading it. They could view it. However, they would not be able to download it. That's essentially what other in higher education they're starting to move to. So from a K-12 perspective, I'm not sure if that's feasible or not or something that we or other districts are doing, if that's best practice. Um, but so we'll have to have open discussions on that. And here later I'm going to talk about me going to a training in Orlando with other Title IX coordinators, other investigators. And then that, I think that would be a good opportunity to see what other individuals, other systems are doing to resolve this particular question. Uh, because I don't know of a mechanism yet that is feasible for pre-K through 12 school districts uh, to meet this requirement and this proposed regulation, some type of live electronic system where individuals can go in, see the, see the material, but not download it at the same time. Or is it appropriate and okay to continue scheduling a time for parties to review all the evidence and make their notes, make their comments on the evidence moving forward? So that's something that we don't, we don't have set in stone yet. And this would be something that would be done, or, or this, this type of evidence made available in situations where you don't have or after a criminal investigation has been completed? So in these instances, this would be the moment that we send out that notice of investigation. It could be accessible from that very same time. So oftentimes criminal investigations can uh, be wrapped up first, uh, depending on you know, how law enforcement says they want us to move forward. But sometimes we're moving forward concurrently with law enforcement as well sometimes. So the, if you're thinking about it from a risk of criminally, what mm -hmm. material might be exposed or shared, there, I could definitely see your concern with that as well. So, Or do you have the ability to redact certain information from this? I, I mean, for example, you know, uh, information that could be used to, you know, figure out where a victim lives. Yeah, so we, um, could, we could do some of those things to protect safety in that regard. But it's really talking about those substantive pieces of the investigation, mm -hmm. things such as that. Like we can't write a party's name because that's going to be substantive to what the allegation is. But you right. know, and those type of things, I don't include in evidence anyways. Okay. I take those things out myself. Like I you have personal notes of principals send me personal notes, and there's things on there that aren't necessarily substantive to the investigation. I'll keep out of the file so it doesn't get mixed in with those type of uh, other materials. So previously, I've, and you can correct me if I'm not remembering correctly, I think we had said that the Title IX investigation would not go forward until criminal investigations were concluded or at least until we had a, uh, an all clear from law enforcement. Does this policy preclude us doing that? It does not. So under Title IX, school districts, it is okay for school districts to have a uh, reasonable delay in their investigation at the request of law enforcement so law enforcement can continue their criminal investigation or can finish their criminal investigation. But that only stops once law enforcement has concluded their criminal investigation, not the actual entire criminal process. Right. The Just the investigation. Is really not, the, is not his investigation, but sometimes when you go from investigation to the DA's office, that process can be literally months or years. Right. And so, the DA sometimes will hold information because they need it for their prosecution. Well, that's, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, that, that's the direction I was going in is that, um, I, you know, you may want to seek guidance from the district attorney's office because, um, you know, sort of a similar conversation that we had about long-term uh, hearings, expulsion hearings, in that, you know, there, there may be information that the district attorney, I mean, uh, you know, their information has to be discoverable to the to the defense, obviously. But you know, if if the defense is able to get a hold of this before discovery, you know, through this process, that can create some some, some real problems for the district attorney's office. Yeah, so. and so I don't think Title IX addresses that far down the line. They sure. talk about up to law enforcement finishing their, finishing their criminal investigation, but they don't talk about the resolution of the criminal case. So that's where we'll have to have ongoing discussions with individuals outside of this room um, to talk about how the we just... The never really been between the school system and police and sheriff. The bigger issues are once you get past that phase and move on to the prosecution phase. Right. So, so it seems like this new um, opening up of what a reasonable time is may give us the leeway to give law enforcement that time. My concern is that we make sure that the student feels supported 
and, and feels like we're doing something when we're waiting for that. So these are, are yeah. some pretty. Even, even without having these new regulations in place, I think that we've done it sufficient because these criminal investigations, most of them are fairly quick. It might be like a day or two and they told us, all right, we're done, and you can move forward. So there's not really a lengthy delay in that. Um, they're, they happen pretty quickly most of, most of the time. Right, but if, the, if law enforcement's keeping a lockdown on the evidence and we have to supply the evidence, then See, that's we're going to be, are we're gonna also be in new under, That's why we can't rely on law enforcement to do our investigations anyway. So we, have, we can utilize law enforcement uh, materials in our investigation, but let's say law enforcement says there's a Title IX incident, it's really severe, really serious, we don't want to jeopardize our prosecution, so we're not going to share a single piece of evidence with you. We can't say to the school system that says, oh, well, law enforcement said we, we can't, you know, receive any of these documents, therefore we're not going to be able to do anything. We still have to do our own investigation and find our own evidence. If we can utilize law enforcement materials in that, great. But if not, we still have to operate and continue re regardless. So. so let's say that's the situation and then um, because some of this evidence is locked down, whatever, we, find, we can't find that there's a Title IX uh, violation. Once we get through the criminal, you know, whatever that process is, can, the, can we reopen at the request of the reporting party saying now there's new evidence now that law enforcement has done this? Um, I'm not 100% prepared to answer that question right now, but I do know for appeal processes, that's kind of going in that process. Um, it just depends on how we want to set up that in our appeal processes and when we're writing this new policy. So if we're allowing uh, each party to appeal equally, and we have, you know, under appeal reasons, you have reasons such as new evidence that was not in existence at the time of the allegation came to, came to light. I could see this being a situation where a person could say, a complainant might say, hey, this, you know, criminal case was, you know, resolved. I got this piece of evidence from the DA or something like that. I didn't have this before. Here it is now. So it just depends on how we want to word our policy in the future. I'm not, I'm not sure at this particular moment that answer, but as we're rewriting this policy, when we talk about the appeal process, that could definitely be a reason to warrant a, uh, a claim for an appeal based on new evidence, if that's how we word our appeal process under Title IX policy. So um, going back to the uh, document here, I think point number 13 is where we are, option to conduct a live hearing. So. We already do this once it reaches a level of expulsion or long-term suspension. So it says if a district calls for live hearings, there, must, there are stipulations in the proposed regulations around providing opportunity for questioning. So we talked about this and um, how do we allow for questioning without having individuals be traumatized and things like that. I think the best practice would be to, and it talks about this in here, allowing written responses so we don't have individuals actually in the same room at the same time, the respondent and the um, complainant. But we still allow individuals to um, write written questions that will then be provided to the hearing officer who would review, read the question, see if it's relevant. And if it is relevant, they would then read the question or provide it to the support person to read to the uh, party itself. And that's how we would have to actually go about conducting these live hearings as opposed to it being like you would see on Law and Order where individuals are on the stand cross-examining each other. That's not how it would be for making sure that individuals aren't traumatized through this process. But just making sure that we're having a process for a live hearing if, it, if it's an option. I think what we're currently doing with the expulsion long-term suspension process, that's probably most likely sufficient, just making sure we hammer out ways um, to allow for live written questions to be provided. and. Um, that, I think that would be the most pressing discussion moving forward. But also, when it talks about this, it talks about point B, making sure that the Title IX coordinator and investigator aren't the decision makers. Those points are already in place. They're already good set up there when it comes to live hearings. So going to point number 14, talks about adoption of different standards of evidence. Uh, point A says districts and schools may use preponderance of the evidence, which is what we're currently using only if the district school uses that same standard in any other student conduct violation process. Now, the way this reads means that uh, we have to use the same standard of evidence for all types of student conduct policies, uh, violations, or allegations. Uh, currently, when it comes to expulsions and long-term suspensions, we use clearing, convincing. Once it, someone's been uh, 
re recommend it for long term uh, sus suspension or expulsion. It has to be proven by clear and convincing evidence. So I am not quite sure if that process at the hearing would then force us to use clear and convincing evidence at the uh, before we even get to these long-term suspension or expulsions. So that's something that I'll still have to research and get more more insight on. But um, based on this reading, I don't think it would require us to go to a clear and convincing evidence. But that's something I'll need more more research and more guidance on. So for long-term preponderance long-term reuse preponderance okay so it's only expulsion. expulsion is clear and convincing. okay so yeah because we use clear and convincing at expulsions I'm not sure if, if these proposed guidelines could be read as you're using clear and convincing um, in another part of your student conduct process therefore you have to use clear and convincing for all parts of your process when it comes to title IX. meaning that clear and convincing would have to be the new standard that we're utilizing moving forward for actually determining that someone's made a policy violation when it comes to Title IX incidents. And Mr. Bullard and I actually had that conversation last week. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I don't think it's going to require us to raise the standard of proof in Title IX cases to clear and convincing. Um, I think the, the gist behind this is just to make sure that my, my interpretation is that the, the proposed regulations uh, are <clears throat> would not want school systems to require a higher standard of proof for a Title IX violation than non-Title IX violation. Correct, and that's what I, that's what I believe as well. Um, and, but, we, and we would not be proposing to do that. Okay, uh, yeah, and so that's that's how I, uh, that's what I see as well. Uh, yes, essentially what Wayne Fuller said. I thought I saw a couple of hands, did I? Uh, okay. So, Number 15 adds a requirement to the outcome report. So we're, we've already been talking about providing written outcome notices of outcome to um, individuals when it comes to these title IX processes. processes. Uh, we would just need to continue that training, making sure that individuals are aware of what's supposed to be in those uh, notices of allegation. I've already created templates that principals can just download, insert the names of the individuals, insert the allegation that's been um, reported, and copy and paste essentially to what fits their particular case. Now points B and C uh, do, uh, did highlight FERPA concerns to me because currently when it comes to K through 12, we don't share with complainants what if a respondent is found responsible, we don't share with them the specific details such as uh, what punishment the school decided to implement on the respondent. We don't share those details. We just tell the a complainant were, whether we were able to substantiate or not the complaint and essentially assure them that we've taken steps to stop prevent remedy um, and allow them to utilize support persons as needed. Uh, under points B and C it says the outcome report must detail any and all remedial actions taken by the par to all parties. Any remedial actions means sanctions and discipline. So I'm not sure how those relate to FERPA. Uh, we can continue to have those discussions. I, I would find it hard that that they would want us to share those those details, but... Um, Have they made any distinction between higher ed and K-12 for that? So there already was a distinction, and the distinction was in higher ed, you can share those details when there's right. the violence. But K-12, the guidelines not specifically said, I think it's the 2001 piece, I think it said January 2001 piece, the the white piece, I believe, it said, where it specifically told what K-12 schools can and can't share. So, but it might be a situation to where these proposed guidelines then take out, you know, conflict and trump what the 2001 guidelines said. So, uh, I'm not sure where that stands. We'll have to kind of see where that goes. But, it, I mean, it wouldn't be much from a actual, a practical standpoint, just adding a couple more points to the template, but how that relates to state law and FERPA, you know, we'll have to have discussions just make sure that that's actually the reading of what the proposed guidelines are actually trying to require school districts to do, it, which essentially be in line with what higher ed is, sharing specific details of what we did to the student. Um, and also, number 16, last piece, just appeals processes. Um, we're not required to provide appeals, but if we do, we have to make sure that we're doing them fairly under point 16 so we can continue to have discussions about what the appeal process looks like um, in the future. So that's essentially what the, the substantive points of the proposed regulations are talking about and how they uh, actually 
affect K through 12, pre-K through 12. So I just want to share those things with you all. Um, I know policy has been on hold for a bit, but that, this is the reason why, I'm trying to um, see what the Trump administration is saying there. So hurrying up with the agenda, I think I was pretty lengthy on that part. Um, I just want to provide a quick Title IX update. So at this point, my day-to-day -day life, when it comes to my role here as a Title IX director, it's really heavy on investigations. I'm doing those, a lot of those. Uh, assisting schools, assisting principals, if either I'm doing an investigation or I'm guiding a principal on how to conduct an investigation. That's a lot of what my, my job is right now. I want to step back from that, but we're not in that point yet until principals and schools are a little bit more comfortable with some of these allegations. So we'll continue that moving forward. But I just wanted to talk about that. The new process with Ethics 360, I think it's been working pretty well. Individuals have a mechanism that they can report anonymously or not any concern that they have, whether it's Title IX related or not. So I think that's been really good uh, for us. Also, I've seen schools that are definitely, I've been hammering and making sure we document things when it comes to these Title IX incidents. If it's not documented, it essentially did not happen. So that's a point that I think schools are starting to understand and really understanding and getting there. Also, making sure that we're still continuing to have an open line of communication with parents. Uh, that's something that I've also been talking to principals and APs about in uh, Title IX world. So as we talked about earlier, we talked about some community education and things like that. So that's, those are some things that are on the horizon. Uh, I think Wednesday, tomorrow, I am doing an interview with Let's Talk Radio show, I think with Mr. Anderson, I think that is his name. Um, so I'll be on there for 45 minutes to an hour or so to really talk about Title IX, what it is to educate the public and the community. Because I see too often parents uh, really get confused about how this relates to criminal process and they have questions that are not necessarily for a school system but maybe might be for an attorney or maybe for the DA or someone in that office. Just to really understand what Title IX is, particularly how it relates to incidents off campus, why is something off campus get me in trouble in school. So. Those are things that I'm continuing to work on, I think, in our meeting in November, we talked about uh, brainstorming some ideas to continue to get the community involved when it comes to educating on Title IX incidents. Um, but yeah, so Let's Talk Radio show, I'm doing that tomorrow. I'm also scheduled to talk with the Family Communication Committee uh, about, a, live, about a, a round table, essentially, about what Title IX is for 20 to 30 minutes. And we've also been in discussion to possibly live stream that so we can send that out to the broader community outside of the individuals that are directly at the FCC meeting. So that's something, some when pieces When is that I, meeting? That is in February. I don't know the exact date. I think it's February 27th, but I have not confirmed uh, with Ms. Adams at this point. Uh, I'm waiting for her to confirm, but I think it's gonna be February 27th uh, when, I have, when, I, when I go to talk about Title IX there. So if you all are hearing of any other avenues where I can continue to make myself known, uh, to the public to continue to educate them about Title IX, what the school district's doing moving forward. <clears throat> I'm open to those ideas. Um, also, I am going to a Title IX investigator training with ATIXA uh, next Tuesday and Wednesday in Orlando. ATIXA is the Association of Title IX Administrators. Um, I think they, they are arguably the number one body when it comes to certifying and uh, training Title IX coordinators, investigators. So I'm going to that training. I've had training before. I'm certified as a Title IX uh, coordinator, certified as an investigator as well. But those trainings were not tailored, specifically tailored to higher education. So Atixa has seen the need now that Title IX has come to the door of K-12 uh, districts uh, to develop their own training for K-12, specific, specific to K-12. So I'm going to that training uh, next Tuesday and Wednesday. So I'll have a report about that or a discussion about that at our next Title IX uh, committee meeting. I think it's gonna be really good for me to be able to network, meet individuals that are in the same um, line of work and have, probably facing some of these same questions that we're facing here in the district <clears throat> because K-12 and a, uh, Title IX and K-12 is such a new uh, process even though it's been around, but it's really starting to be a focus. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, Going to next steps, we're still talking about policy, which is uh, a lot of what we talked about today with the proposed guidelines. Um, and in the future, as we talked about getting some type of regular training of responsible employees, that's something that's on my agenda in the near future. 
uh, onboarding and also getting some type of regular training for students as well. So those are things that's, that's on my agenda in the near future. Um, also, uh, Jacqueline White, Ms. Dr. White, she's not here today, uh, but she wanted me to talk about um, a colleague of hers, uh, Dr. Dorothy <coughs> Espelich, who is a um, expert in bullying, harassment, and school safety. Uh, she works for UNC Chapel Hill, and um, she does research that focuses on translating empirical findings into prevention and intervention programming, and she has secured over $12 million of external funding. Uh, she advises members of Congress and Senate on bullying prevention legislation. She conducts regular webinars for uh, CDC, NIH, and NIJ to dis uh, disseminate research. So that's someone she shared with me that could be a potential resource for uh, the district here. I just wanted to share her name, her information with you all, um, and maybe we can have discussions on if there's a role for her for the district in regards to what we can do, maybe a training or something like that. But that's a name that uh, Dr. White provided to me. I just wanted to share with the committee. So that's all that I have on my agenda. I think next part we have is a partnership opportunity on racial um, equity training by Dr. Smith.
pretty intensive. And so most of the folks that I've talked to that have gone through that training, you can't go through that and not do your work the same way. It really helps to shift your, your lens. And so the community, the groups that we're working with um, are interested in that, but it's a pretty expensive training. It's about $11,000 because it's two very full and intensive days. And so the reason I share with you is because I don't know if your organizations or the groups that you're associated with would have an interest in helping to partner, support this work. With the groundwater training, we have folks who are donating, you know, personally as little as $70. And then we have organizations that are donating in excess of $2,000. So it really doesn't matter the amount. Um, it is just about the collaboration and the connection with the, with the community. So that is why I'm sharing that information with you. So if there's anyone who's interested, you know, my name is LaShawn Smith. I'm the deputy superintendent for the district. Pretty easy to find my email if you don't have it. Um, but you surely can reach out to me and I can connect with your organization. Definitely add you to our email group um, and keep you in mind as other opportunities for them. And glad to answer any questions that you might have. Well, if not, thank you. Just a couple of things on the administrative updates. Uh, Jerome mentioned Ethics 360 that is up and running. Uh, so far, the resistance is working well. Uh, I like it. Our principals have had a couple of issues. We're getting some false reports, but I anticipate that anytime we put a new system. We saw it, we uh, see something, say something, and they've leveled up. Uh, would it help next month? Rel's talked about the forms that he's created. Do you want to take a look at those forms next month, the standardized forms? All right, we'll put those on the agenda for next month. Ms. Eastad, anything from the board chair? Um, just maybe a couple things. Down the line, I would love for us to talk about possibly creating a, a PSA on Title IX on, you know, on this really this blue sheet, kind of a summary, something that we could push out to, through the, maybe a board meeting, and then again to the public, so that parents, it would help parents and students to understand um, this whole process and how it will work uh, in, a, in a more informative process. We, did, uh, the, we do a superintendent's on the t a show on, the, on the, our local NHCS. He was there last month. I think he's scheduled to meet with Stephanie Adams, Family Communication Committee. Once we have the final regs, we do a, a, a monthly blog. He's going to be getting that out, what is Title IX. Uh, I like the PSA piece as well. That would be a, a great addition to that. Yeah, I mean, even if we can have something that can be explained from a parental point of view, from a student point of view, something just a little different. So it's something to keep in mind down the line once the regs do come out. Um, the other thing that I would, uh, I'm in looking at it from the, the, the special ed lens that I think I always have on is, um, and something to talk about and maybe something we can get into the, um, the, uh, the ACES committee is talking about sexual harassment from that perspective. Um, special ed students, uh, people with, with um, disabilities are at a risk seven times higher than the general population, about seven times higher um, than the general population of being sexually assaulted. And I think we need to keep, uh, I would like that um, to be discussed at some point in some, in some realm um, because we have a, you know, we have a, a population of students who, you know, are at that increased risk. So, um, so, you know, this in this um, committee that might not be the place for it. But I want to keep that in mind so that we can have that discussion somewhere. I was just thinking about that as we're talking about Title IX, as we're talking about sexual harassment. Um, that is, uh, we we have several vulnerable, vulnerable populations, and that is one of them. So that's just something that that was kind of floating around there. So I wanted to, to keep that in mind. And there's a task force. I don't know how often they still work. Um, pull together but with Coastal Horizons that we've had partnership with from the school system and some school staff um, specifically related to individuals with intellectual disabilities because that's the population that's most vulnerable. Yeah. Okay, thank you. We, we could make those contacts. 
Okay. So I have that written down here, and um, we'll move forward to those discussions on the next uh, agenda and committee meeting. Uh, other than that, thank you all for being here. Uh, that's all I have. Look forward to the next meeting. Crystal, what's our next meeting date? I think that does not work for me. Let me check my calendar really quick. We have Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee at 5. So, at five. so Tuesday, Tuesday, the 18th. Tuesday, the 18th should work. I'm actually supposed to be in um, Charlotte on the 17th presenting at a conference uh, for dropout prevention about Title IX and equity. So the 17th won't work. I assume I would be back in time uh, for a meeting on the 18th. But uh, kind of in the 18th, then same time, same place. All right, anything from the group, or we uh, I want to thank everyone again for, for coming, and we will convene. Oh, uh, yeah, folks.